Okay, folks, let's get started. How's exam prep coming? Yeah. That's not like kind of a combination between eh and good. So I'm guessing that's somewhere in between the two? Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope it's going well. I know there's a lot of material. And as I said yesterday, I will cover, the exam will cover everything through the end of enzymes. So I'll get through that today, obviously. And um, my strong recommendation is use my highlights as a guideline for your studying. And they should help you through there. Also look at the practice exams, not so much for the questions, but for the format. The format of the exam that you will see will be identical to the one that's on the practice exam. Points may vary a little bit, but the uh, format of the exam will be the same. Okay, So make sure you understand how that exam works and how those questions are because sometimes people get confused about the format. So make sure that you look through that format of the practice exam I have for you online. Okay. All right. Well, last time I got going through talking about various parameters, and that was kind of a parameter intensive lecture. We still have some parameters to get through here. And I will uh, talk you through those. But um, as I talked to a couple students uh, earlier today, I'll tell you the same thing I told them. And that is, think about these things in terms of concepts. Think, think of these in terms of tangible things. If you look at these as a bunch of numbers, or you look at these as a bunch of calculations, you're going to see it in a very different way than if you look at it in terms of the concepts that I'm trying to teach you. That's why I get you to try to avoid using that calculator. I can assure you, you will not need a calculator on the exam. If you want to have a simple one that gives you comfort, bring it, that's fine. You can't have a graphing calculator or anything like that. But you're not going to need it. And moreover, if you punch things into a calculator and you punch them in wrong, you're going to lose points. But if you just leave it alone, where you would punch it into a calculator and everything else is right, you'll have it. Okay? So I want to break you in that calculator habit. Well, yesterday I talked a fair amount about Vmax and KM. And I want to just come back and say one more thing about that before we go forward. And this is a, a matter that is something that is oftentimes confusing to students. And so I want to make sure that this entire class doesn't have this confusion. Okay? And that's this. All right? KM is the substrate concentration that gives Vmax over 2. That does not mean that Km is Vmax over 2. Vmax over 2, you'll notice, is this point over here on the graph. And Km, you'll notice, is this point down here on the graph. Km is a substrate concentration. Vmax over 2 is a velocity. OK? You don't say that 60 miles per hour is equal to 3 grams per liter, do you? There'd be no way to compare them. Or 60 miles per hour is equal to 60 grams per liter. It wouldn't make any sense. So you shouldn't say that Vmax over 2 is the same as Km, because it'd be like saying a velocity is the same as a concentration. It doesn't make any sense. All right? So Km is exactly what I said. It is the substrate concentration that gets a reaction, gets an enzyme, to Vmax over 2. That's what Km is. OK. Km, as I noted yesterday, is a constant. Okay? It's a constant. It doesn't matter how much enzyme I've got. The enzyme has the same Km. All right. Well, now that we've gone through the simple things, we're going to deal with something else that's simple. You thought I was going to say something hard, didn't you? Okay. Velocity versus substrate concentration. Gave you that hyperbolic plot, right? We saw a sigmoidal plot, and we'll talk more about sigmoidal plots later. But right now, we're going to think only about those hyperbolic plots. And those hyperbolic plots, as you saw yesterday, it's kind of hard to decide where am I going to draw that line for Vmax. Okay? I have to decide where that line gets drawn. So biochemists being lazy people, you guys are going to get tired of hearing that, I know. But biochemists being lazy people all right, like to find better ways to not have to make that decision where I draw that line. All right. So they use alternative plots of the same data. The same data. Except for the alternative plots. Well, how do I do an alternative plot of the same data? The one I'm going to show you is called a double reciprocal plot. 
It means I take the reciprocal of every value that I had, that is the inverse, 1 over, and then I plot it. So instead of plotting velocity, I'm plotting 1 over the velocity. Instead of plotting substrate concentration, I'm plotting 1 over the substrate concentration. And when I do that, that hyperbolic plot turns into a beautiful straight line. A beautiful straight line. Now that straight line is really useful because here's where my data was out here where this solid line is because this, these were all substrate concentrations. They're now 1 over substrate concentration. But if I draw that line across the y-axis and all the way down to the x-axis, I get two useful pieces of information. The place where it crosses the y-axis is exactly equal to 1 over Vmax. So now I don't have to guess where Vmax was, where to position that line. I can read it here. I can say, well, whatever the value of this is, take the reciprocal of it, and I'll have Vmax. That's useful. It's very simple. The place where the line crosses the x-axis is equal to minus 1 over Km. So I don't have to guess that one either. Bang, I've got it. This plot is called a double reciprocal plot. It's also called a line weaver Burke plot. L-I-N-E-W-E-A-V-E-R. Burke, B-U-R-K. So a line weaver Burke plot, we don't need to don't worry about the equation. Don't even worry about the slope. If you know the two intercepts, you can figure everything out that you need on this plot. This is really useful. Really, really useful. Because it gives me an exact value for how to find 1 over Vmax. Consequently, I know how to find Vmax by taking the reciprocal of that. Okay. All right. This is a little sideline, but I'll show you some values of kcat. Remember, kcat yesterday was the turnover number, number of molecules of product per molecule of enzyme, right? If I look at kcats of various enzymes, I see some remarkable things. There's 40 million per second. Okay, there's 1 million per second. There's uh, a fair number right there, that's 14,000 per second. There is 190 per second. And there is 0.5 per second. We see quite a, a range of kcats. That is quite a range of speeds that these enzymes are working at. You might ask, well, why don't all the enzymes work up here at 40 million per second? And part of the answer is what I talked about yesterday, which is the fact that you don't want to take a Maserati to, to Fred Meyer every time you go to Fred Meyer. Because if you drive 200 miles an hour every time you go there, the likelihood you're going to have an accident and kill somebody is high. And similarly, you don't want all of your enzymes working at breakneck speed because you've got to control them. There's times you want them going and times you don't. And if they're going so fast, getting them stopped at a specific place is hard to do. You might very quickly get beyond the point where you want to get beyond. So, Cells don't want to have enzymes going as rapidly as they can. Okay. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to talk about with respect to enzymes is really interesting from a health perspective. Okay. For anybody interested in medicine or pharmacy or things like that, this, what I have to say here, should be of interest to you. In fact, it should be of interest to everybody because you love biochemistry, right? Yeah, okay. All right, now, inhibiting enzymes is really important for controlling things. If I can inhibit the critical enzyme of HIV, I can stop HIV from replicating and causing problems. If I inhibit the enzyme, I'm getting a cold sore right now, if I inhibit the enzyme of the cold sore virus, then I can stop that cold sore from coming on, and I'll save myself some pain. Okay. So one of the things that's involved in drug design is finding inhibitors of enzymes. So it's important that we understand then what enzyme inhibition is all about. I'm going to talk in this class about two types of enzyme inhibition. Okay? Two types. The first is called competitive. 
competitive inhibition. All right? What's competitive inhibition? Well, competitive inhibition actually has a very intuitive feel for most students. All right? You see it schematically shown here on the screen. Here is our enzyme. Here is the normal substrate that the enzyme binds to. And here is an artificial inhibitor of that enzyme. And you'll notice that it looks, at least part of the molecule, looks very much like the normal substrate. It inhibits the enzyme because when it binds, it stops the enzyme from functioning. Now, what does it mean to say competitive? First of all, the types of inhibition I'm talking about here are reversible. They're not covalently bound. They are reversible. The inhibitor can come on. The inhibitor can come off. It turns out that's important for certain types of chemotherapy I'll tell you about in just a bit. Okay? So they're not irreversible. That is, they, they can be reversed. All right. <clears throat> the competitive inhibitor, when it's bound to the enzyme, the enzyme is sitting there doing nothing. If I start binding up enzyme with competitive inhibitor, there's not going to be as much enzyme to make product, right? Everybody with me? OK. So competitive inhibitors will compete with the natural substrate. They look like it. They resemble it. But when the enzyme binds to it, the enzyme is stuck. It can't do anything until it lets go of it. The non-competitive inhibitor is shown below. The non-competitive inhibitor is shown in green. And you'll notice that a non-competitive inhibitor does not compete for the active site of the, substrate, of the enzyme. Instead, it's binding to a different site on the enzyme and stopping the enzyme from functioning. There's no competition. In this case up here, we've got competition because this guy and, and this normal substrate are competing for the same place on the enzyme. This guy down here is, is trying to bind to a different site. The substrate has nothing to do with this site. This second type of inhibition we call non-competitive. Non-competitive. Okay. Now, these two types of inhibition have some very important considerations. Okay. Let's think about competitive first. Let's go back to that plot we did of V versus S, and let's think about the V versus S where we have a competitive inhibitor. Okay. So where was our V versus S? Here we are. Okay. Here's our V versus S plot, ignoring all the text on there. That's what it looks like. When I do, <coughs> excuse me, when I do an experiment, I'm going to do it the same way I did before, but I'm going to have two sets of tubes. One set of tubes, I'm going to have varying concentrations of, of uh, substrate, fixed amount of enzyme, fixed amount of time. And that's going to be my regular V versus S plot. That's going to be what's going to give me this. My other set of tubes, I take and I have varying amounts of substrate. I have fixed amount of enzyme. I have fixed amount of time. But I add a fixed amount of inhibitor to each tube. Why do I add a fixed amount? Because again, I only want to have one variable, and that variable is going to be substrate concentration. Right? OK. My shoe's untied. Now. What's that second curve going to look like? Well, let's think about what a competitive inhibitor does. It's competing with the substrate for the active site. At low concentrations of substrate, who's going to win? The inhibitor. At high concentrations of substrate, who's going to win? The substrate, right? Let's imagine that I start out, I've got a one-to-one -one amount of inhibitor versus substrate. There's going to be an equal chance the inhibitor or the substrate is going to find the enzyme. Right? That basically means 50% of the time the enzyme is going to be tied up. Right? 50% of the time the enzyme is going to be tied up. Let's imagine when I get way up here, I've got a million times more substrate than I have inhibitor. That means 999,999 times the enzyme is going to be bound to substrate, and one time 
it's going to be bound to inhibitor, right? Do you think I could tell the velocity of something that had 999,999 times compared to 1 million? Probably not. They're going to look identical. So when I have a high substrate concentration, it's essentially as if I have no inhibitor, right? What's Vmax going to look like? Is it going to be the same or is it going to be lower when I do the reaction with a competitive inhibitor? Same. It's going to be the same. The reason is because the substrate outcompetes the inhibitor. Most of the drugs that we work with that inhibit enzymes are competitive inhibitors. They resemble the substrate. I'll give you a real good example. Okay. It's a drug called methotrexate. It's given for chemotherapy. It resembles an intermediate that cells need to make nucleotides. It resembles an intermediate that cells need to make nucleotides. It's a competitive inhibitor of that molecule that cells need to make nucleotides. <clears throat> cancer cells, some cancer cells divide much more rapidly than regular cells. They have a much greater need for nucleotides. If I give a competitive inhibitor in a high enough concentration, I'm going to slow the production of nucleotides. I'm going to ultimately kill the cancer cell. Now this is why I want this guy binding non-covalently because I can only give the drug to the whole body. If it binds to the enzyme irreversibly, it's going to bind irreversibly in my regular cells just like in my cancer cells and it's going to kill my regular cells. So what I do is I give it for a short period of time a short enough period of time that it has a chance to kill the cancer cells, but it gets flushed out of the regular cells so the regular cells survive. Okay? If it bound to the enzyme covalently, that wouldn't happen. That short period of time, the cancer cells are much more susceptible to that drug than the regular cells are, and the cancer cells die. One of the reasons we see people get sick or lose their hair or whatever with chemotherapy is because of that because of the fact that that cancer drug is killing some regular cells, but hopefully preferentially killing cancer cells as well. That's a competitive inhibitor. Okay. Questions about what a competitive inhibitor does or how it works? Yeah. What if the inhibitor has a greater affinity for the enzyme than the molecule Yeah, that's a good question. So what if the inhibitor has a lower KM than the substrate has. What do you think? Right? No, I'm asking you, what do you think? What, you think, you think that, that would work better? It would. It would, exactly. Okay? So if the, if the inhibitor had a lower KM, if the enzyme had a lower KM for the inhibitor than it did for the substrate, yeah, that would be, that would be ideal. That would be great. You could use less of it, right? Absolutely. Okay. Now, what do you suppose happens to the KM? When I, when I put this into this mix, okay? Well, we said down here, we're going to have a lower velocity, right? When we've got low amounts of substrate, the inhibitor's going to win. This curve's going to be below here, right? It's ultimately going to catch up way over here, but down here, it's going to come up lower, right? What do you suppose is going to happen to KM? It's going to shift to the right, right? So what's going to happen? So KM Vmax over 2 is going to be the same in both cases. Here's one curve. Here's the other curve. There's the KM for the inhibitor. The KM increases for a competitive inhibitor. Vmax does not change. Now we're going to see exactly the opposite is going to happen with a non-competitive inhibitor. Exactly the opposite. Let's think about a non-competitive inhibitor. They're not competing for the active site. Okay? If I have a thousand enzyme molecules and I add 
100 inhibitor molecules. It doesn't matter how much substrate I have, I'm always going to knock out 100 enzyme molecules because the amount of substrate isn't going to matter because they're not competing. The inhibitor is always going to bind to 100 enzyme molecules. Everybody understand that? Because they're not competing, it doesn't matter how much substrate I add, I'm always going to have the same fixed amount of enzyme that's going to be knocked out. All right? Everybody got that in your head? No? All right. Talk to me. Substrate. If I add more substrate in the first case where I have a competitive inhibitor, okay, if I had a competitive inhibitor, then the substrate wins because it outcompetes. They're not competing for the same site with a non-competitive inhibitor. The non-competitive inhibitor is binding to a different site. It can bind to it irrespective of whatever how much substrate there is. Okay, did you have a question? Very good question. So part of your question, her question is, if a non-competitive inhibitor binds something other than the active site, does it work by changing the shape of the active site? And that's usually what it does, yes. And by doing so, it stops the substrate from being able to bind. Kind of cool. Yes, sir? A non-competitive inhibitor can come off as well. So if it comes off of one, it goes on to the next one. But at any given time, I'm going to have a fixed amount that's tied up. But yes, it's, it's, it's non-covalent as well. It comes off and goes on. All right. Yeah? Why do we use competitive inhibitors more often? Well, competitive inhibitors are easier to design because we know the shape of the active site. We know the normal molecule that binds. It's really hard to try to figure out not only something that will bind to a different site, but also change the enzyme when it does bind. Okay, that's a simple answer to your question. All right. Ideally, you'd think, well, non-competitive inhibitors would be a really good way to go, but they're really, really hard to design because you have a hard time predicting what they're going to do. Make sense? Okay, good questions. You guys are thinking about it. Yeah, more hands, yeah. That's correct. So her question, I, I'm repeating it for, for the people who can't hear on the microphone. Uh, the question was, since you have a fixed amount of a non-competitive inhibitor, does that mean that there's a fixed amount of the enzyme that will always be bound to it? And the answer is yes, it will. And that, that brings up an important point I'm, I'm coming to, but that is important to keep in your mind. There's going to be a fixed amount. So I gave an example of 1,000 molecules of enzyme, 100 molecules of inhibitor. That's going to reduce the amount of active enzyme on average from 1,000 down to 900. Okay? You with me there? Uh, am I, are you with me on that, the question? Okay, yeah. Back up here. I can't hear you. Yes? Okay. So his question is, and you're, you're, this is a very good question also, you're, get, you're, getting, you're, you're really thinking about these models. Okay. So his question is, uh, given the induced fit model, does the non-competitive inhibitor only bind after the substrate has bound? And the answer is, A, that's a very technical question, but in simple answers, the, in simple terms, the answer is no. So it's the binding of the non-competitive inhibitor that stops, in simple terms, the enzyme from binding to the substrate. Okay? Yes? Can the, can the body compensate by making more enzymes? The body can, uh, in some cases, do that. But if the cell has died before it got a chance to do that, then the answer is no. So in a, in a chemotherapy case, we're killing cancer cells in a matter of hours, and it takes days to divide cells. So that's the strategy that you, you, you defeat. But even, even there, there's no guarantee the cell will make more enzymes. In some cases, it may. In many cases, it may not. Yes, Julia. If the substrate has bound, can the non-competitive, and this is really good questions, guys. I've never had my 450 cl class ask me this many good questions. Can, so the question was, if the substrate has bound, can the non-competitive inhibitor bind and knock it off? Well, 
The answer is, I suppose it's possible, but think how fast this enzyme is working. So it would have to do it in that fraction of a second, and it probably wouldn't be a big factor for it in the, in the scheme of things. Yes, it might be a factor, and there are some types of en enzyme inhibition that actually, they're called uh, uncompetitive, and we won't talk about them, but they relate partly to what you're talking about here. Okay? Yes? So how are and KM? No, you're getting, okay, now you're ready to go to the next thing, so that's fine. Uh, any other questions on this? Well, I'll come, that's exactly my next, my next topic. Everybody got all the parameters? It's good. You guys can be my best enzyme class ever. I want to see that. All right. So to answer your question, well, what happens to KM and Vmax? Let's think about this. I've got two sets of tubes. One set of tubes, no inhibitor. It's got 1,000 molecules of enzyme active. I've got the other set of tube over here. It's got a fixed amount of inhibitor. Each one has 900 molecules of enzyme active. Tell me what happens when I change the amount of enzyme to Vmax. As I change the amount of enzyme, Vmax is going to change. And if I decrease the amount of enzyme, I will decrease Vmax. So non-competitive inhibition will give me a lower Vmax. And the KM stays the same. Now that's usually the most difficult concept to for you to understand. And rather than go through a technical explanation of it, it doesn't take much technical, but I'm throwing a lot of concepts at you. I'm not going to tell you why. If you would like to know why, I'd be more than happy to tell you. OK? How's that for keeping it simple? Competitive inhibition, Vmax the same, KM increases. Competitive inhibition, Vmax the same, KM increases. Non-competitive inhibition, Vmax decreases, KM stays the same. OK. I honestly have never gotten that many good questions about enzymes. Very pleased with that. OK. You suppose you could predict what would happen with those on a plot? You could draw those out, V versus S. What's it going to look like for a, for a non-competitive? Is, 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 are the curves going to meet at the top? No. It's going to flatten off before it gets there, right? Right? OK. That's right. So for the competitive, it would eventually reach it, but it would take longer to get up there. That's correct. Would the shape of competitive be, be convex? No, it would not. It will actually sort of mimic that hyperbolic. OK, very good. Very, very good, guys. OK, um, let's see. Let me think about this. OK, let's, what do you say we do a song to celebrate? OK, so I got a song that summarizes all this. It's called Enzymes. It's to the tune of an old song way back when I was a kid, which was back in the dark ages, called Downtown. Enzymes. OK, you guys get the idea. All right, so please join me. Reactions alone could starve your cells to the bone. Thank God we all produce enzymes. Throw your hands up in the air. Units arranged to make the chemicals change because you always use enzymes. Sometimes mechanisms act like they are at the races. Witness the K-cat of the carbonic anhydrases. How do they work? Inside of the active site, it just grabs onto a substrate and squeezes it tight in an enzyme. Catalysis in an enzyme. V versus S in an enzyme. All of this working for you, enzyme, enzyme. Energy peaks are what an enzyme defeats in its catalysis, enzymes. Transition state is what an enzyme does great, and you should all know this, enzymes. Catalytic action won't run wild, don't get hysteric. Cells can throttle pathways with an enzyme allosteric. You know it's true. 
So when an effector fits, it will just rearrange all the subunits inside an enzyme. Flipping from R to T, enzyme. Slow catalytically, enzyme. No change in delta G, enzyme, enzyme. You should relax when seeking out the Vmax, though there are many steps. Enzymes. Line Weaver Burke can save a scientist work with just two intercepts. Enzymes. Plotting all the data from kinetic exploration lets you match a line into a best fitting equation. Here's what you do. Both axes are inverted, then you can determine Vmax and establish Km for your enzymes. Sterically holding tight enzymes, substrates positioned right enzymes, inside the active site enzymes, enzymes. Okay, very good. Thank you, thank you. Okay. What, what was that? Okay, so if I had four, the reciprocal of four would be one over four. Gotcha. Right? One over that value. So the reciprocals are quite easy to do. Okay, um, that's the end of the material for the first exam right there. That's the end of the material for the first exam. Okay? That is a lot of material. Okay. So everything I'll talk about from here, this point forward will be on the second exam, okay? As I said yesterday, I will do a review session, excuse me, tomorrow night after class, and uh, I will videotape that, that uh, review session. Well, we're not done with enzymes. Oh, I know. You guys like enzymes, though. You're such a good class with enzymes. You're my favorite enzyme class. That's not a small thing. I've had a lot of classes, so this really is a very good honor, guys. Enzymes have to be controlled, all right? Just like that Maserati going to Fred Meyer, we got to watch the speed. We got to control the enzymes because enzymes can lead us into a wreck if we're not careful, okay? Now, we've got several ways that cells control enzymes, all right? I've sort of alluded to one of these, and I'm going to say some more about it now with this part of the lecture, and it's called allosteric control. If you recall yesterday when I defined allosteric control, I said it's when a small molecule binds to an enzyme and affects its activity. You'll notice I said affects its activity. I didn't say inhibits or activates because it depends. Some molecules can activate an enzyme. Some molecules can inhibit an enzyme. And whether it activates or inhibits is going to depend completely upon the enzyme and the allosteric control molecule. Okay? So let's think about this now. The classic enzyme that we describe allosteric control for is a really interesting enzyme. It's called ATCase. You'll hear more about it later in the term. And it has a big honking name, but we'll just call it ATCase, okay? And ATCase catalyzes a reaction that's necessary for making this molecule over here, carbamyl aspartate. No, you don't need to memorize the name of that, okay? But this reaction is the first reaction that precedes a set of about 10 reactions that ultimately produces the nucleotide CTP, okay? Now, I'm going to repeat that, and then I'm going to try to put this into a little perspective for you. So, ATCase catalyzes a reaction that's the very first reaction in a pathway that leads ultimately to CTP. Now, what does that mean, okay? Every chemical reaction that occurs in the cell is catalyzed by an enzyme. Every
chemical reaction that occurs in the cell is catalyzed by an enzyme. Yes? I'm sorry? Oh, Mr. Jumpy. Oh, I hate that thing. Okay. I get the gun out and shoot that thing. I'd probably mishandle the gun and shoot myself, which would not be a good thing. What's that? Yeah, that'd be nice to do. <laughs> Bam, right? Okay. Now, every reaction in the cell is catalyzed by an enzyme. If I have 10 reactions, you see here where it says series of reactions? Every one of those reactions is catalyzed by a different enzyme. So I got 10 different enzymes that go from this guy here down to this guy down here. I'm interested in this enzyme, ATCase. I'm not interested in all these other enzymes. Well, why do I show you this? Okay? I show you this because it gives us a very important way of understanding the efficiency with which cells work. Okay? What does this mean? All right. So here's our first reaction. ATCA is catalyzed it. There's our product. Okay? Cells have to be very careful not to make too much of something. Because if they do, they're going to waste energy. They're going to waste resources. If they use too much resources for one thing, they may not have enough resources for something else. They may starve to death. Cells want to balance how much of something that they make. More importantly, when we're talking about nucleotides, and yes, this is a nucleotide, and there's a misspelling there, isn't there? Okay. This is a nucleotide. Cells have to be especially careful. The reason? If they make too much of one nucleotide and not enough of another, they mutate. Cells will make mutations, that is, they will change their sequence if they make too much of one nucleotide versus another. So they've got to be very careful not to make too much or too little of any given nucleotide. OK. Now, I'm setting the stage for the control of this enzyme. I haven't talked about the control yet. Now I want to tell you about the control. You recognize it's going to be important to control this enzyme. Sometimes you want to turn it on. Sometimes you want to turn it off. Okay? That's done by allosteric control. And there are three different molecules that can allosterically control this enzyme. Okay? The first one you see on the screen here, it's actually CTP. CTP inhibits the enzyme. When CTP binds to the enzyme, it inhibits it. Notice that CTP doesn't look anything like the substrates, which are up here. What type of inhibition do you suppose this would have? Non-competitive. Non exactly. Okay. Most allosteric effectors work non-competitively. Not all, but most. All right. This guy binds to the enzyme. Now, this turns out to be really efficient. Why is this so efficient? Well, let's think about it. When the cell starts making this, and it makes this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and it finally makes this, if I start making too much of this, I don't want all this other stuff to happen, right? I stop the very first enzyme in the process. If I'm the chief of General Motors, and I decide that they're making too many, too many uh, pickup trucks, I don't stop at the place where they put the muffler on. I stop at the place where they start making the truck. Because otherwise, they would waste all that money of getting all the way up to putting the muffler on, and I wouldn't put the muffler on, which would be like an average truck, I think, anyway. But I didn't put the muffler on. OK? I would have wasted all that energy, and I still would have nothing to show for it. I inhibit the very first one in the process, really efficient. I save all this other stuff from happening. I'm not wasting resources. This type of inhibition I've just described to you is allosteric control because the small molecule is binding to the enzyme and affecting its activity. It's negatively affecting it because it's turning it off. Okay? 
and it's doing something. We give a name to this kind of inhibition. This kind of inhibition is called feedback inhibition. What's happening? The end product is feeding back and telling the enzyme, stop. Stop the whole pathway. That's really efficient. It works very well. Okay? And as a result, cells don't make too much or too little ATCase. Well, this shows how we turn it off. We've got two other ways of turning it on. And I'll show you those as well. Yeah. Well, that's a very good question. Her question is, is there a threshold amount for this to, before this process starts to occur? And the answer is, yes, there is. And uh, that'd be a good exam question, so I'm going I'm to I'm verbalize the exam question for you right here. No, no, I'm not going to make an exam question out of it, okay? But this would be a really good exam question. What would you predict would be a threshold amount that might be important to consider here? What concentration would be important to be thinking about? No. Think of the enzyme parameters, guys. What's the enzyme parameter that affects affinity? Km is a substrate concentration, all right? That gets Vmax over 2, right? So the affinity, the more affinity the enzyme has for the substrate, OK? That's going to change things, right? There's also an affinity for the inhibitor itself. Okay, we haven't talked about it, but the enzyme will have an affinity for the inhibitor itself. That threshold amount is going to depend on how much the enzyme likes that inhibitor. So yes, that's a very good question, and that is the answer to that question. It depends on the affinity that the enzyme has for the inhibitor. Very good question. Okay. That's how one way we inhibit the enzyme. Okay. We're going to see a couple ways we can actually activate the enzyme. Okay? Here, okay, before I do that, here's, here's feedback inhibition shown a little bit better. Here's that very first reaction. Okay? If I don't stop it, it's going to go all the way down to here. I, it says 7. I think it's actually 10. But in any event, the final product inhibits it. That's what feedback inhibition is all about. And there are many enzymes that are inhibited by feedback inhibition. A really good example, cholesterol synthesis in your body. We'll talk about that later, but your body makes cholesterol. It's a very important thing for your body to make. We think of as cholesterol as all this bad molecule stuff, but cholesterol is important for your body to make because your membranes need it, especially your brain. Did you know that? 14% of the dry weight of your brain is cholesterol? You think you're stupid, maybe you don't have enough cholesterol, right? <laughs> bad, OK, all right. In any event. Cells make cholesterol, and the pathway to make cholesterol takes about 30 steps. Almost every step requires some energy. Okay? So there's an enzyme very early in the pathway that's inhibited by cholesterol itself. Cholesterol binds to it, turns the enzyme off, and it stops all those other steps from happening and stops the, the cell from making too much cholesterol. Okay? So feedback inhibition works on a variety of systems and it's a very, very useful way to control how much of something is being made. Okay. Now, I showed you the plot earlier for ATCase, and we saw that it was a sigmoidal curve. It was not a hyperbolic curve, right? Okay. It looked like that. I told you that when we thought about that sigmoidal curve, we compared that to the hemoglobin oxygen binding. And we said, oh, yeah, that sort of makes sense because in the case of hemoglobin oxygen binding, binding of one oxygen changed the hemoglobin, and now it really started to want to bind other oxygens and do its thing, right? Okay. It turns out that the same thing happens with some of the activators of ATCase. Okay. One of the activators of ATCase is actually a substrate for ATCase, aspartate. Okay, so let's go back and look at the reaction that it catalyzes. The reaction that ATCase catalyzes is right here, and aspartate is one of the substrates. Okay, this is a plot of velocity versus aspartate concentration. 
what do you suppose that aspartate is doing? A little bit is binding and is changing the shape of the enzyme, and the enzyme is getting more active. ATCase is a really interesting enzyme, folks. It has not one, not two, not three, not four subunits, but it actually has 12 subunits. 12 subunits. It has six subunits that are identical that we call regulatory. And it has six subunits that are identical that we call catalytic. I'll give you a hint. CTP binds to the regulatory subunits. It binds to the regulatory subunits. We talked about the R state and the T state in hemoglobin, right? What favored the T state? Nobody studied for that for the exam yet. What favored the T state? No. 2,3-BPG. Remember? Because 2,3-BPG favored the release of oxygen, didn't want to bind it, right? It turns out that CTP favors the T state of ATCAs. Favors the T state. What favors the R state of, of, of hemoglobin? Oxygen. Binding of oxygen favored binding of more. What do you suppose is going to favor the R state of ATCase? Aspartate, right? And you see it right there. Now, I said there were three molecules that affected ATCAs. I haven't told you about the third one, but it's even more interesting than the other two, I think. Okay. I'll tell you what it is, and then I'll tell you why it's interesting. It's ATP. ATP favors the R state of ATCase, which means it makes it more active. ATP binds to the regulatory subunit. Where do you suppose aspartate binds? Okay, it's a substrate. Where would a substrate bind? At the active site. That's going to be the catalytic subunits. Yeah. So aspartate binds to the the um, um, catalytic subunits. ATP and CTP bind to the regulatory subunits. Let's summarize everything here. CTP favors the T state, reduced activity. ATP favors the R state, increased activity. And aspartate favors the R state, increased activity. Now, there's something that's really cool about all three of those, and that's what I'm going to finish with today. Okay? The thing that's really cool is this. Cells have to decide at some point should I make whoopee or should I not? Well, for a cell, that means do I divide or not? Okay. That's a big decision for a cell because division requires replication of DNA. It means you're making a lot of proteins. It means making a lot of RNA. It takes a lot of energy. Right? If the energy level of a cell is low, what's its level of ATP? Low. Right? If the ATP level is low, what's going what's to happen to ATCase? Well, it's not going to be activated by ATP. It's going to be less active, right? Energy level low, make fewer nucleotides. That makes sense. We're not going to divide, guys. On the other, on the, um, what did I say? ATP level's low. ATP level's high, OK? ATP level's high. We have plenty of energy. Spring is here. Let us go forth and multiply. Let us go forth and divide. We need more nucleotides. We activate ATCA so we can make more nucleotides so we can divide. That's cool. If we make too much CTP, uh-oh, got a problem. We're going to mutate. Better turn, our, turn this off because we don't want to have so much CTP. We'll wait until we use up what we've got before we start making more. 
and we start using up what we've got, things don't bind to ATCase anymore. Very cool. How does aspartate fit in there? Aspartate is an amino acid. Not only do cells have to think about how much energy they have to divide, they also have to think, do I have the resources that I need to divide? Do I have sufficient quantities of amino acid to make the proteins that I need? If aspartate concentration is low, what happens to the enzyme? It's not going to work. Division's not going to happen. If the cell has plenty of aspartate, hey, it's time to party. Let's divide. We're going to activate. ATCase, we're going to make CTP. That's really cool. I'm running over, so I better shut up. So I'll save that. I'll pick up that point with you tomorrow. Oh, whoa, sorry. Um, there we go. Yep, come on, I gotta get the camera, come on up. What's up? So, say these non-competitive inhibitors